Good evening and welcome to the 44th Annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. Please remember that there is a public reception with plenty of food and drinks immediately following the lecture in the Bade Museum, which is across the plaza. Uh, just go outside and just follow your nose. <laughs> and I would like to thank Melissa Hennig, who with the guidance and help from Wendy Arce and their crew of helpers did a wonderful job setting up the reception. And I, this was our first distinguished faculty lecture reception, and I hope you could do many more. <laughs> Thank you. So what is the uh, Distinguished Faculty Lecture? Always a highlight in our consortial calendar. This lecture gives us a chance to honor a member of the GTU faculty whose scholarship exemplifies the kind of faith-filled wisdom and knowledge that we value and hope to nourish here for the sake of our religious communities and the wider society. Nominations for Distinguished Faculty Lecturer comes, come from the faculties of the member schools and the roster faculty of the GTU, who are invited to nominate one person from any GTU school except their own. The council deans then reviews the nominations and makes the final selection. What this means is that the consortial faculty is choosing one person each year whose scholarship they respect enough to set forth as representative of the highest standards of this ecumenical and interreligious community of scholars. Before we introduce this year's distinguished faculty lecturer, I would like to introduce the respondent first. It is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Dr. Horsey Reverend Dr. Dorsey, sorry. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Dorsey Uder Blake, Faculty Associate in Leadership and Social Transformation at Pacific School of Religion, where he received the Distinguished Alum Award in 2007. Prior to joining the faculty of PSR, Dr. Blake served as Dean of Faculty and Visiting Professor of Spirituality and Prophetic Justice at Star King School for the Ministry for six years. Moreover, Reverend Blake served as the director of the Center for Urban Black Studies at the Graduate Theological Union and core faculty member at the GTU. Thank you, Dr. Blake. And we look forward to hearing your response later this evening. After the response, we will have about 20 minutes of Q&A with the audience. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Marianne Farina, Professor of Philosophy and Theology at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, and last year's distinguished faculty lecturer, who will have the honor of introducing this year's distinguished faculty lecturer. It's my honor tonight to introduce to you our Graduate Theological Union's Distinguished Faculty Lecturer for 2019, Professor Munir Jiwa. Professor Munir Jiwa is a colleague, mentor, friend to so many of us here at the GTU, the Bay Area, and the academies across the country and the globe. His scholarship has enriched our own research, writing, and teaching as well as challenged us to consider areas of intersection and creativity within and among the various circles of Islamic studies and interreligious engagement. Professor Jiwa is the founding director of the Center for Islamic Studies and an associate professor of Islamic Studies and Anthropology at our union, and serves as a faculty at the Haas Institute of Religious Diversity Cluster at UC Berkeley. He holds a PhD and MPhil in Anthropology from Columbia University and an MTS from Harvard Divinity School and held postdoctoral positions at MIT at, and at the University of Toronto. His research interests include Islam and Muslims in the West, 
Islamophobia studies, media, art, and aesthetics, secularism, religious formation and leadership, religion in the public sphere, and interreligious theological education. From 1996 to 1998, Professor Jiwa served as the, at the UN World Conference for Religions of Peace, assisting the Secretary General on conflict transformation programs in partnership with interreligious councils around the world. He worked especially with youth in Bosnia, Sierra Leone, and all over the Middle East, and in Japan. He has continued to consult and work with these programs every summer, mentoring students around the world. He and the CIS are recipients of foundation awards and grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Ford Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council. At the time of its 10th anniversary celebration two years ago, the Center for Islamic Studies had offered more than 700 public programs advancing dialogue and understanding and building bridges with a larger number of communities and organizations locally, nationally, and internationally. In addition to the many committees Dr. Jiwa has, has and is serving on the GTU, he currently serves on the Islamic Studies Advisory Council for Public Education at Stanford University and on several committees and boards at the University of California, Berkeley, including the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, Public Theology Inquiry Group, and the Islamophobia Documentation and Research Project at the Center for Race and Gender. And he has played a role in Religious Norms in the Public Spheres Project for institutions and governance programs at UC Berkeley, where he was a fellow from 2011 to 2014. Professor Jiwa also serves on the advisory committee for the Society of A for Asian Arts and the chairs and chairs the American Academy of Religions Standing Committee on Racial and Ethnic Minorities. He received the GTU Sarlo Excellence in Teaching Award in 2015, and he has two forthcoming works titled "Politics of Exhibition: Artists and Muslims' Identity in New York City." and a second volume coming out called Islamic Studies in Intersectional Context. Tonight, Professor Jiwa's lecture is entitled Liberal Inclusion or Liberal Conversion, Islamophilia, Islamophobia, and Islamic Studies in Interreligious Context. He will examine the particular and the unquestioned Euro-American liberal values and norms assumed to be the universal. He asks, how do the regulatory effects and violence of civilizing, disciplining, and securitizing missions in the name of liberal and the secular missions remake Islam and Muslims? And how the academy both aligns with and challenges such agendas in the current political climate? Please join me in welcoming Professor Munir Jiwa. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace and a warm welcome to you all, including those online. I want to begin by acknowledging the Ohlone people whose ancestral lands we are on. Thank you, sister, Dr. Marianne Farina of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, my dear sister, for your generous introduction, and more importantly, for your collegiality and friendship, and for being so central to the work of Islamic studies at the GTU, your commitment to scholarship and teaching and service, including your tireless efforts in working with the Muslim communities. Thank you. I also want to thank all my colleagues for this honor of presenting the distinguished faculty lecture, and to Dean Kim, Melissa, Dr. Arce, and his office for organizing, and, and the Dean's office for organizing this beautiful event. It is heartwarming to see so many colleagues, friends, and family here. I express my deep gratitude in advance to Dr. Dorsey Blake for offering some reflections on my presentation this evening. Dr. Blake is a dear mentor and friend who I look to for his scholarship, 
pedagogy, moral clarity, his courage in speaking truth to power, and his love and care for so many of us. I want to also begin by sharing how indebted I am to the work of the late Edward Said, to Laila Abu Lugot, my advisor at Columbia, Talal Asad, Judith Butler, Wendy Brown, Du Bois, Franz Fanon, James Baldwin, Malcolm X, and many others. I'm especially grateful to the late Saba Mahmoud for her years of mentorship and friendship and her intellectual influence in the academy. In spring 2008, I was invited to attend a strategic communications workshop in Washington, D.C., sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The workshop focused on Islam in America and brought together Muslim leaders, professors, policymakers, and media professionals with the goal of thinking about the media frames that have come to dominate how Islam and Muslims are represented. It was a brilliant and hope-filled two days. At the end of the workshop, it was announced that Carnegie would open up applications to fund such a workshop at two additional institutions. The GTU ended up receiving the grant for 2009. Shortly after the DC workshop, I began a conversation with a prominent journalist who had written for the San Francisco Chronicles, then Religion Beat. I had had extended conversations with him about Islam and Muslims, Islamic studies, the CIS, the GTU, and he eventually decided to interview me at length for a piece that would later be published in UC Berkeley's California Magazine in the January-February 2009 issue. What surprised me then, and now no longer does, is that no matter how much I tried to nuance his questions, armed with my recent uh, training at the DC workshop, my undergrad degree in communications, or provide sophisticated analyses on representation, or my work with Muslim and interfaith communities, the conversations always came back to the dominant media frames, which I will discuss at length in this presentation. The discussions were around Islam and Muslims having to provide ways of showing their compatibility with liberal and secular modernity's values, forsaking the more important questions about how Islam and Muslims came to be liberalism and secularism's other. Another reminder was that one subject position of being identified as a Muslim continues to mean that what you say is most often tied to Islam. The journalist got much of that article wrong, and he may have thought it may want little to do with him after that. I didn't let him off the hook. I did what we do at the GTU. I invited him to dialogue at our Carnegie-sponsored workshop in March 2009, titled, Who Speaks for Islam? Muslims and Media Networks. He was surprised, attended the workshop, and it was a transformative experience. I very often have to navigate to being seen only through my identity as a Muslim. In other words, I must be saying what I am because I'm Muslim, regardless of my academic credentials or other subject positions and identities. This often puts me and minorities in general on the defensive because we are trying both to attend to excluded histories while at the same time often being evaluated on our objectivity and judged as not having a sufficiently critical distance from our identities. For example, in many of my discussions in and out of the class, when I'm looking at the history of Euro-American empire and its continued violence in the world, my critiques are often viewed as coming from Islam or my being a Muslim rather than, for example, my training in anthropology, or being Canadian. Just go to North to get a vast and steady stream of critiques of the United States. <laughs> in my own field of working within contemporary Islamic studies, teaching on topics such as secularism, liberalism, modernity, war and violence, identity, media, art and aesthetics, Islamophobia, the politics of pluralism, religious formation, interreligious engagement, and the diversity of Muslim expressions, I find myself needing to work within the normative frames through which Islam and Muslims are most often represented in the Euro-American public sphere and media. These frames are what I have called the five media pillars of Islam, namely 9-11 as, as the predominant temporal lens through which we approach Islamic history and theology and Muslims in the US, terrorism and violence, Muslim women veiling gender and sexuality, Islam and the West, and finally, the Middle East as the geographical, spatial lens through which we view the entire Muslim world. So these five media pillars of Islam. 
The first frame, 9-11, tends to be the most dominant temporal frame used in thinking about Islam and Muslims, most certainly in the United States. As Jean Baudrillard wrote in his provocative 2002 piece, publication Spirit of Terrorism, when it comes to world events, we have seen quite a few. From the death of Diana to the World Cup, and violent real events from wars right through to genocides. Yet when it comes to symbolic events on a world scale, that is to say, not just events worldwide, not just events that gain worldwide coverage, but events that represent a setback for globalization itself, we had none. Through the stagnation of the 90s, events were on strike. Well, the strike is over now. Events are not on strike anymore. With the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, we might even be said to have before us the absolute event, the mother of all events, the pure event uniting within itself all events that have ever taken place. 9-11 has become a temporal frame marking Muslim presence in the public sphere in the United States, but it erases the long history and presence of Muslims in the Americas, forcibly brought over during the Atlantic slave trade, as Sylvian Diouf and others remind us. It also erases the important history of African American Muslims in the United States, central to understanding America and Islam in America. In addition, 9-11 becomes a way of thinking about the questioning of symbolic power, the Twin Towers as both symbols of global capital and a site of sacredness. The second frame, terrorism and violence. The second frame used to discuss, think about, and represent Islam and Muslims in the American public sphere is terrorism and violence. We can hardly think about Islam and Muslims today without thinking about terrorism, or constantly asking Muslims to denounce terrorism. Jihad, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, Burqa, and Madrasa are all English words now, and most of the American public knows them only as English words. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Palestine, Syria, Guantanamo, Abu, Abu Ghraib, these are all frames and archives through which we think about Islam and Muslims consistently connected to violence. Talal Asad's book on suicide bombing is instructive for its discussions on death dealing and the effects of different forms of violence. Some forms of violence shock us, while some do not, even as they destroy lives. I would argue along the lines of Judith Butler that in addition to Assad's uh, discussion on the scales of violence, our different responses to violence are also related to whose lives count as lives to begin with. I would argue that some forms of violence are acceptable to us when we perpetrate violence on others, justifying it as being in their best interest and for the sake of freedom, democracy, and security. Yet when these same forms of violence are perpetrated against us, we interpret them as products of hatred, evil, religious fervor, fundamentalism, and terrorism. These forms of violence are also differentiated by whether or not they are state-sponsored. It is often the spectacular nature of violence and the lack of predictability of violence uh, perpetrated by Muslims that is said to be the reason for such different differentiation. But I would argue the endless war on terror is also unpredictable and has killed far more people. To understand our differentiated approaches to violence and death dealing requires studying these phenomena both in terms of power and in terms of classifying people, individuals or individual or collective, as subjects or objects, as victims or perpetrators of violence. The third frame is Muslim women unveiling. We often talk about Islamic patriarchy as if patriarchy were intrinsic and limited to Islam and Muslims. Our concerns about Muslim women driving in Saudi Arabia, honor killings in Pakistan, or saving Afghan women from the Taliban-imposed burqas, itself having a long colonial history, seem misplaced and excessive when the alarming rate of rape of women in the United States, or the fact that women are exploited by and enslaved to a multi-billion dollar beauty and sex industry. Given the magnitude, scale, insidiousness of the ex ex exploitation of women here, one would expect to see a lot more national and collective outrage. It seems then that def the defining difference is that women in the West are free to choose their exploitation, and women in the rest of the world, especially the Muslim majority world, are in need of such choices. 
The discussions marking and evaluating different societies according to the rights they accord to their women and other minorities is now extended to sexual minorities, which Joseph Massad and Jasbir Puar and others have written about so brilliantly. Focusing on legal categories at the level of the state alone often misses out on accounting for the great diversity of lived experience, and hence the importance of looking at both. For example, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan recognizes the category of the third gender on national identity cards. Long seen as part of South Asian societies, hijras are protected by the state and can choose the category of third gender to identify themselves. There are numerous examples of how Muslim societies have protected sexual minorities in various ways across time and place. And amongst the most watched television show a few years ago in Pakistan was Late Night with Begum Nawaz Ali, where the male host, Ali Salim, performed in drag the female character, Begum Nawazish. Given his popularity, Ali, uh, Ali Salim now hosts his own show as himself. In light of this national legal recognition, does this all of a sudden make Pakistan more liberal than the West? Can the West learn from Pakistan about gender and sexual minorities, given that it's hard to imagine recognition of this sort, uh, of this sort uh, currently in the United States? What about our abusive use of multicultural knowledge in the case of Abu Ghraib, where Muslim men were piled up in naked homosexual poses to, to the pleasure of a US female soldier giving a thumbs up, or other male detainees on a leash? One could argue that in war, people are not themselves, but here it was intentional. Drawing on multicultural man manuals and books, including Raphael Patai's The Arab Mind, mm -hmm. which Seymour Hirsch mentioned in the New Yorker uh, article on Abu Ghraib, as the Bible of the neocons of Arab behavior, and used by military officials claiming that Arabs are particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to sexual humiliation. The ideas we hold, prescribing a state to specificities and scripts based on whether they are Islamic or not tells us little about the way in which people live their lives. The same is true if you focus on the hijab, or more specifically on women, Muslim women's various forms of headscarves. Headscarves have been mobilized as a colonial strategy to secure entry into the Muslim-majority world, including the way the burqa was used to gain military entry into Afghanistan. Returning to my point about Pakistan's third gender, notice how those transgendered men, or men who cross-dress as women, don't think twice about wearing headscarves. That is not their focus. My point here is that veiling by Muslim women has been taken up in the West as a major frame and focus, especially as it relates to the rights, to rights discourse in legitimizing war, but that the discussions lack the nuance of Muslim lived experience. Where gender advances are made in the Muslim-majority world, they are often ignored, especially by Western feminists, on, on procedural grounds, especially when Muslim women look to the Qur'an and the prophetic tradition for liberation and guidance in living more piously. Laila Abu Lugod's brilliant works, especially her most recent work, Do Muslim Women Need Saving?, along with Saba Mahmoud's many excellent works, help us to understand these, in more these discussions in more detail, including the importance of rethinking categories of freedom, agency, authority, and the human subject. In this context, how, would you, how do we think about the fact that Pakistan has had a female prime minister, like other Muslim-majority countries? How do we think about Congresswoman Ilhan Omar? It seems momentarily the problem with the oppressed Muslim woman has shifted to women who, who dare to speak out. Where is the collective outrage at the sexism and racism against Congresswoman Omar? It seems that the Islamophobia that visible Muslim women endure is something that is justified because of their Muslimness, forgetting the sexism and racism so intrinsic to the hate mail and death threats she receives. Whether around Muslim women's rights or LGBTQ rights, the liberal savior complex follows imperial and colonial strategies used to divide, rule, and control societies. As Joseph Massad has said in his work on Islam and liberalism, one of the more compelling issues to emerge out of the gay movement in the last two decades is the universalization of gay rights. This project has appropriated the prevailing U.S. discourse on human rights in order to launch itself on an international scale. Following in the footsteps of white Western women's movements, which had sought to universalize its issues through imposing its own colonial feminism on the women's movements in the non-Western world, 
a situation that led to major schisms from the outset, the gay movement has adopted a similar missionary role. When the Gay International Insights Discourse on Homosexuality in the Non-Western World, it claims that the liberation of those it defends lies in the balance. In espousing this liberation project, the Gay International is destroying social and sexual configurations of desire in the interest of reproducing a world in its own image, one wherein its sexual categories and desires are safe from being questioned. Because it has solicited and received some support from Arab and Muslim native informants, who are mostly located in the United States, and who accept its sexual categories and identities, the Gay International's imperialist epistemological task is proceeding apace with little opposition from the majority of sexual beings it wants to liberate, and whose social and sexual worlds it is destroying in the process. In undertaking this universalizing project, the Gay International ultimately makes itself feel better about a world it forces to share its identifications. Its missionary achievement, however, will be the creation not of a queer planet, but rather a straight one. The fourth frame is Islam and the West, or the so-called clash of civilizations. The idea that, somehow, that Islam and Muslims are somehow foreign to America and American values is problematic on many levels and feeds into the xenophobia and racism that claims our, our way of life is being threatened. As mentioned in the first frame on 9-11, first and foremost, this binary forgets the long history of Muslims in the West, African Muslims who were forcibly brought over to the Americas during the Atlantic slave trade, or the long history of African American Muslims. Or, in the context of Europe, we forget to go beyond immigration debates to remind ourselves of Bosnian Muslims as Europeans. In this frame, the primary discussion generally focuses on questions of democracy and freedom, and Islam's compatibility with the West in terms of values, reinforcing somehow that Muslims are less American or less European, returning to the language of us and them, with Muslims having to prove their loyalties. The most insidious part of this, as we have seen in the efforts by Pamela Geller and Stop the Islamization of America organization, Geller's group attempts to instill fear in the American public by stating that Muslims following Islamic ideology are appearing to be moderate and hiding their real efforts at exerting a jihad against America, which she and other Islamophobes refer to as a stealth jihad. An example of this, according to Geller's group, is how Sharia is taking over uh, America and American legal systems. More importantly, she attempts to show how Islamic values, laws, and traditions have always been at odds with so-called progressive Judeo-Christian civilization. Were it not for the millions of dollars being poured into funding the Islamophobia industry, very often endorsed by state officials, we might be able to dismiss such blatant Islamophobia, but unfortunately, mobilizing the concept of freedom of speech and expression permits the exercise of such hatreds. The disciplinary lessons in culture and civility are numerous. Whether it is how not to be offended or how to be properly offended are controlled by a liberal machine that hardly self-reflects on discriminatory ways in which offense or harm is caused in the differentiated ways in which protections are offered to some but not to others. The academic questions I had and have can be captured by this quote from Sabah Mahmoud. Political secularism is the modern state's sovereign power to reorganize substantive features of religious life, stipulating what religion is or ought to be, assigning its proper content, and disseminating concomitant subjectivities, ethical frameworks, and quotidian practices. The fifth frame. If 9-11 is the temporal frame through which we think about Islam and Muslims in, the Amer in America, the fifth frame is the Middle East as the geographic and spatial frame. The focus on the Arab world and on Israel and Palestine is central to this frame, even though we know that the majority of Muslims live outside the Middle East, namely in South Asia, with the largest Muslim majority country being Indonesia. While a focus, um, while a focus on the Middle East may be relevant, given the origins and practice of the faith, for example, the annual Hajj uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, and the centrality of the Arabic language, the fixation on the Middle East is usually tied to politics, oil, terrorism, and Orientalist fantasies, and is generally not about the profound intellectual, and co intellectual contributions of Arabs and Muslims to the West, including the incredible history of Arab Muslim contributions to the sciences, aesthetics, architecture, and art. 
In class, we unpack these totalizing frames and discuss how difficult it is to work outside of them, given the risks of them being unrecognizable or apologetic. We often begin with the language we use, such as progressive, moderate, fundamentalist, including unpacking other English words, such as jihad, madrasa, Taliban, al-Qaeda. Notice how none of these come up as errors in spell check. We also focus on how to unlearn or challenge the predominantly Christian lens through which we attempt to understand the Islamic tradition. For example, by not imposing the methodologies of biblical hermeneutics onto Quranic studies, by noting how religious norms are so often liberating in, mo in many communities around the world, by challenging liberal and or secular norms and values, or by not dismissing feminisms that might base their liberation in the Quran and the prophetic tradition. Or, for example, when I'm trying to get my students to think about how Islam is mobilized and in instrumentalized in claims about religious violence in the world, I challenge them how not to think about Islam, religion, and theology alone, but instead to focus on the historical, social, political, and economic context in the military-industrial complexes in a globalized world. This takes a lot of imagination among my diverse MA, MDiv, MTS, PhD, and DMIN students, who even in their care and sensitivity often find it difficult to extend themselves to think beyond the confines of Euro-American Christianity, secularism and liberalism, which present themselves as universal. Having international students presents or students uh, present or students from different traditions adds significantly to the breadth and depth of class discussions. There is also a difference in the way class discussions are experienced by Muslim and non-Muslim students and those who are in, in Islamic studies and those who are studying other traditions or from other academic disciplines or perspectives. Often it is not students alone who need opportunities to learn about Islam and Muslims, but also faculty, administrative leaders, and leaders in ministry at the GTU member schools. We must be willing to ask the difficult questions of our own traditions that we so confidently ask others and become aware of the biases we hold that often reproduce the larger political and media frame, frames I mentioned. Many tend to think that because we are a progressive consortium, this makes us more inclusive. In my own experience, this has not always been the case. First and foremost, there is a profound ignorance about the history of exclusion of Islamic studies in theological schools and, sec and the secular academy in the United States, which, if better understood or known, would help theological schools and seminaries understand the need for Muslim traditions to also be studied normatively and confessionally. Interestingly, in my experience, liberal ministries claiming to be the most inclusive have often set up the most obstacles in our diverse academic study of Islam, often subjecting us to identity politics and practices of faith issues that are part of their ministries and particular denominational and ideological approaches, rather than allowing us our focus on the underrepresented scholarly tradition of Islam and Muslim diversity in the academy. Indeed, while we are becoming more publicly aware of the systematic production and dissemination of Islamophobia by the right, we tend to overlook the left because it often presents itself as working in the interests of Islam and Muslims. Some of my own work and critique of Christian ministries and theological schools focuses on the particular ways that my own uh, um, particular ways that discussions, especially on women, gender, feminism, and sexuality, have been mobilized by the Euro-American left to discipline and exert power over Islam, Muslims, and Islamic studies in its own selective liberal image. As just, mentioned, as just mentioned, this reproduces a colonial process of divide and rule and creates an index of good and bad Islam and Muslims to use Mahmoud Mamdani's distinction between good Muslims and bad Muslims. Islamophilia and befriending and promoting Muslims who uphold liberal values in Islamophobia and intimidation against those who resist or provide nuance through critique. To quote from Andrew Shryock's book, um, Islamophobia and Islamophilia, uh, Beyond the Politics of Enemy and Friend, um, this gives you a sense of uh, the good Muslim, bad Muslim divide. The good Muslim as a stereotype has common features. He tends to be a Sufi, ideally one who reads Rumi. <laughs> he is peaceful and assures us that jihad is an inner struggle spiritual contest, not a struggle to enjoin the good and forbid the wrong through force of arms. He treats women as equals and is committed to choice in matters of hijab wearing and never advocates the covering of a woman's face. If he is a she, then she is highly educated, works outside the home, 
is her husband's only wife, chose her husband freely, and wears hijab, if at all, only because she wants to. The good Muslim is also a pluralist, recalls fondly the ecumenical virtues of medieval Andalusia, and is a champion of rich faith activism. He is politically moderate, an advocate of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom, an opponent of armed conflict against the US and Israel, and finally, he is likely to be an African, a South Asian, or more likely still, an Indonesian or Malaysian. He is less likely to be an Arab, but as friends of the good Muslim will point out, only a small portion of Muslims are Arab anyway. Registers of our humanity are based on this binary. So fundamentalist and self-selecting are these unquestioned liberal norms and markers, and so totalizing and myopic are their frames, that efforts to reframe liberal politics puts Islam and Muslims on trial. To quote Mahmoud, political secularism is the modern state's sovereign power to reorganize substantive features of religious life, stipulating what religion is or ought to be, assigning its proper content, and disseminating concomitant subjectivities, ethical frameworks, and quotidian practices, just to repeat that. This raises important theological and academic questions, such as, how do we understand colonial conceptions and practices of time and space embedded in terms like progressive and universal, so intrinsic to ministry, mission, and empire, which collude on the left and right? How are Western liberalism, secularism, and the strategic assertion of the Judeo-Christian civilization reconfigured vis-a-vis -vis Islam and Muslims, and the attempt to reform them, especially using the frames of law and citizenship? By what stretch of the American imaginary, and under what conditions and limits can we make possible expanded norms of recognition of Islam and Muslim life? And perhaps most importantly, how do we rethink the power inherent in the production and dissemination of knowledge? I think continuing to ask these questions is important, and especially as we build programs in Islamic studies, and even more so in interreligious studies, so that we might begin to, to see how discriminating our sets of questions are when it comes to different traditions. While difficult questions are welcome and necessary for advancing scholarship and understanding, the larger concern here is what often presents itself in the language of diversity, or calls for diversity, are really what I have experienced as liberal forms of Christian proselytizing, or what I have called elsewhere liberal fundamentalism and conversion. Singling out Muslim students, uh, Muslims, uh, students who happen to be Muslim, and singling out their Muslim identity over other identities, and asking where they stand on certain issues just recently being discussed in the US and European context, makes such parochial questioning Euro-American centric and subject to Euro-American time. Mm -hmm. Liberal tests, and let's see uh, Professor Butler's work um, in Frames of War, are the new ways liberals create classes of good and bad Muslims by reserving this particular kind of scrutiny to Islam and Muslims. As Sabah Mahmoud has suggested, we need to question liberalism too. And I would add, we should also question liberalism's exclusions, its deceits and limits, its claim to universality, and its claim to liberate all people. We live in perilous and precarious times marked by constant violence and war, refugees and displacement, environmental crises, the rise, against, the rise again of white supremacy, policing, policing and killing of black people, ethno-nationalism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and global Islamophobia, including the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar, or so-called rehabilitation centers of the Uyghur Muslims in China, the occupation of Palestine, and the degrading situation in Kashmir, the countering violent extremism programs and surveillance and securitization of Muslim communities in the US, the monitoring and curtailing of religious and academic freedom, and the consistent underrepresentation and misrepresentation of Muslims in mainstream media, politics, and beyond. In this post truth era of alternative facts, fear, rage, and the rise of white supremacy in the United States and Europe, Islam and Muslims occupy a strange national platform through which Islamophobia and Islamophilia can be expressed and mobilized for those and against Trump's bans, walls, profanities, and exclusions. Within the last couple of years in the United States, Muslim women, Muslim women in hijab went from mostly being seen as oppressed to temporarily becoming the face of freedom, for example, in the 2017 
uh, Women's March. In response to Trump's Muslim ban in 2017, people of all backgrounds came together in solidarity and protest at airports throughout the country where public prayers were welcomed, public sites became venues for public expressions in support of pluralism and patriotism in solidarity with Muslims. Yet, while we have seen such apparent Islamophilia in the past, it is usually short-lived, and Muslims and other minorities know all too well how such solidarity can be temporary, contingent, and political. As we often hear, Islam and Muslims become a means, uh, become a means by which white liberals can vent their frustration at Trump. As many ask, would any of this have happened if Hillary Clinton became president? And yet this painful lesson is now ironically forcing the nation to face itself and its history of denials and exclusions. It is important for me to acknowledge something very critical here. And over the last year, in a multitude of settings, in our classrooms and hallways, in the library, two on the streets, in our multiple communities and online. Many students, alums, staff, faculty, scholars, trustees, and community members have shared with me the deep feeling of sadness, hurt, marginalization, alienation, racism, and Islamophobia they have experienced here at the GTU. It has been heartbreaking to see how many students of color and Muslim students have for the first time since I have come here 12 years ago expressed how worried they feel and the slow process in acknowledging their pain, suffering, and feelings of betrayal by the GTU. Many have shared with me that they didn't want their critique to impact Islamic studies, and so they remained silent. Some of them worried about being international students. Some of them worried about funding. All of them worried about the well-being of the GTU. They have expressed their fears of a divisive campus climate, the fear of surveillance of their academic work, and the fear of attacks on their communities. The lack of safety they have expressed is not only physical, but intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. The harms and moral injury expressed need to be heard and healed. With the world fractured as it is, the GTU has to be a shining example to the world. And I'm heartened that after a year of struggling in silence, and in small huddles at the GTU, thanks to so many students of color and Muslim students, a process of transparency, accountability, and dialogue has finally begun. I want to take this moment to publicly express my gratitude to the brave and courageous students who have begun expressing the pain and suffering they have experienced here at the GTU this last year, and acknowledge all those who feel they can't come forward. Know that the dignity you have shown in the face of racism, Islamophobia, discrimination, and the harms you expressed to have experienced will be addressed. Thank you for your moral courage, for your leadership, and for speaking truth to power at a time when it is increasingly difficult to do so. Please know that you are loved and welcomed, and we are here in solidarity. The presence of Islamic studies is critical today in theological schools and seminaries, not only for the reasons of historical exclusions, but also to acknowledge the profound contribution of Muslims to Western civilization. Islam is also an American religion here, right from the time African Muslims were enslaved in the Americas during the Atlantic slave trade. And there is a long, rich history of struggle amongst African American Muslims who have upheld the faith. Islam and Muslims make significant contributions to how we collectively reflect upon ourselves in profoundly new ways in the interreligious and interdisciplinary context where we study and live our faith. Islamic studies is not just an add-on to how we think about, teach, and practice interreligious studies. It is integral to these. We need to study and reflect on the Islamic tradition in its own specificity and history, and we need to do so in the context of mutually constitutive histories, histories of overlap, entangle, entanglement, and messiness, but also histories of shared intellectual and spiritual learning. The Center for Islamic Studies exemplifies the critical role that Islamic studies and Muslims play in theological schools and the larger academy. As we reflect on the CIS's first decade and think to the years ahead, 
Addressing the challenges we face today and anticipating the future, CIS provides and facilitates opportunities for dialogue at a time of heightened divisions nationally and internationally. To date, our over 50 MA and PhD students and graduates in Islamic studies, along with CIS faculty and visiting scholars, bring vast experiences and histories that transform the GTU and beyond, coming as they do from 19 countries and speaking, reading, or writing 35 languages. A remarkable global diversity that characterizes Islamic studies at the GTU. The CIS has established itself as an important and leading partner in the GTU Consortium and at UC Berkeley. The GTU Consortium is also an interreligious, interreligious, intercultural, interdisciplinary, and international uh, institution. And CIS has advanced sound scholarship in Islamic studies while also contributing to the dialogue on the pressing issues of our time within the academy and beyond. As we grow our programs in Islamic studies, which include the arts, as we, as we continue discussion in areas such as Islamic leadership, chaplaincy and spiritual care, environment and sustainability studies, and as we expand pedagogical initiatives such as online and immersion learning and course intensives, and diversify and increase our library resources, there's still so much that needs to be learned and shared academically and administratively within and across the institutions. There are major contributions that the study of religions and theological contexts can jointly make. Because interreligious education aims to equip students with skills and professional competencies of sensitively navigating commonalities and differences within and across traditions, we have the opportunity as a group of scholars and faith practitioners to advance the positive role of religions in academia and public life, in media, the arts, museums, public policy, law, social justice work, business, and, related religi and religious communities. I think of this work as mediation, translation, and boundary crossing, as it reframes religions and religious practitioners as sources of divisiveness to ones that promote dialogue and understanding through critical engagement. Advancing religious and interreligious literacy in theological schools, which includes understanding people and their intersectionality, and understanding things in their historical, social, political, and economic context, has tremendous transformative potential in the larger public sphere. I want to end with two quotes from articles by Sabah Mahmoud. My sense is that what is needed in the current moment of political chaos is not so much stringent and pious calls for the reassertion of secularism, but a critical analysis of what has been assumed to be the truth of secularism, its normative claims, and its assumptions about what constitutes the human in this world. This is not simply because such an exercise is intellectually compelling, but because what we take to be the moral superiority of the secular vision needs to be rethought urgently. Apart from the fact that the secular vision does not command broad allegiance in the world today, I fear that it is premised on a propensity to violence that is seldom questioned. The vantage point accorded from the position of the current U.S. foreign policy in its vast ambition to remake Islam makes this violence visible in a manner that should give one pause about what might be entailed in calls for the, restora for the restoration of secular liberal political rule. Rather than ask the question of how Muslims can become better liberals, I believe it is far more pressing to ask how the world is or can be lived differently. Confronted as we are with a historically unprecedented, homogenizing force of modernity that will broke no arguments for an alternative vision. Thank you. Asante.
profound, disturbing, and yet you gave us a sense of hope also, if we do the right thing. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to the human diet, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile, and mouth with myriad subtleties. <clears throat> Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile. But, O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing. But, O, oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet, and long at the mockery. But, let the world dream otherwise. We wear. Paul Lars Dunbar. I am so grateful. I think I'm rethinking this in the near after following you. I am so grateful for the opportunity to respond to the profound presentation of Dr. Manure Juwan. I was fortunate enough to interview him for the position of director of the Center for Islamic Studies. And I knew then that he was the person to assume the enormous task of guiding and building the center. I was particularly impressed with his knowledge, with his media credentials, his background communications, as well as his religious background and attending Harvard Divinity School. And I felt that he would be a tremendous asset to achieve the work ahead. I applaud him for not only his presence at the CIS, but also for his work that has inspired students at the GTU and communities beyond the Bay Area. Indeed, the work of CIS is known and celebrated throughout the nation and internationally. Well done, good, faithful, visionary, prophetic, effective director, and person of unbounded integrity. It has been profound, the presentation. I've been very moved by it. And again, if we face and hear his message and move forward as he has outlined, the GTU will certainly be enhanced, leading to even greater heights as a leader in interreligious companionship. Whenever I hear a presentation, I always inquire about the context in which the presentation took place. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who wrote the poem I read, was born in 1872 after slavery, and yet experienced the ways in which oppression against black folks continued. His poem deals with a method that oppressed people had incorporated into their lives just to survive. The mask is a strategy. It is deception. It is hypocrisy to hide the pain of exclusion, marginalization, indignity, sacrificing authenticity, in the words of Dr. Howard Thurman, sacrificing the sounds of the genuine within oneself in order to just sort of get along. When I think of the context of your presentation, 
I think of the context of empire. And it's important for us to understand that we live in empire. And the empire always seeks our souls. It always extracts. It always leads to the corrosion of our souls for the benefit of discontinuation if we're not careful. It demands our allegiance, names us, claims us, and even shames us. This is true not only for the individual, but for institutions as well. Institutions must conform to the dominant ideology in exchange for the crumbs from its table, such as property, tax exemptions for religious institutions, and exemptions from military service for its leaders. It also asks the institutions for their support in perpetuating its ideology and dominance, its agenda, is Islamophobia. We are expected to transmit rather than transform the dominance. Support rather than dethrone the powers that exist. Institutions face the dilemma of how to be authentic themselves. One of the questions I raise is how much the GTU perpetuates the dominant ideology rather than embrace and risk new forms different ideologies, different epistemologies that may, and is, that may be is salvation, and the salvation of the larger community of which it is a part. How does it opt for freedom, for alternatives from the oppressiveness of the dominant culture when it comes to Islamic studies? There have been centers before at the GTUs that are now gone. I served as director of one of them, the Center for Urban Black Studies. There was also an Office of Women's Affairs, which later became the Center for Women and Religion. There was the Pacific and Asian American Center for Theologies and Strategies in Paris. Among the issues, fundamental issues, each faced was how their new, different pedagogies, methods of relating epistemologies and different styles of leadership fit into the existing institutional culture maintained by Eurocentric, Eurocentrism and patriarchy, by liberals who had veto power over them. Wonderfully liberal people also had a difficult time accepting the leadership accepting the fact that the leadership of these centers knew what they were doing, what their constituents needed. These centers, to an extent, represented the insurrection of subjugated people and subjugated knowledge. The new wine offered was placed in old wine skins, totally inadequate containers. I love the way Munir organized his presentation, particularly the lens of the five media pillars of Islam. Indeed, the first frame, 9-11, tends to be the most dominant temporal frame used to think about Islam and Muslims in this nation. When the twin powers, when the ten, twin powers fell, what was once impenetrable was obviously penetrable. What was invincible was seen for its fragility and for the whole world to see. American soil was soiled. The unthinkable had occurred with great coordination and precision. The Twin Towers, the symbol of this nation's prowess, the symbol of its world-controlling capitalism, fell with a mighty fall. I sometimes wonder if part of the trauma that U.S. citizens experienced was the outrage that people that they saw as inferior was able to carry out such a daring and successful enterprise against the most powerful nation in the world with the most sophisticated weapon system humankind has ever known. 
Pain and hatred against Muslims erupted. Islamophobia became a legitimate response to what had happened. Even in liberal San Francisco, there is a rally scheduled to attempt to address what had happened and to call for no military retaliation. I was asked to speak at the rally, donned in a suit and wearing a stole. I walked up Mission Street in San Francisco to Dolores Park and heard the words in liberal, progressive San Francisco, I'm glad you're not a Muslim. The first media pillar, as Dr. Jiwa explained also, in the case, in his response, that Muslims have been in this country a long time. During the transatlantic slave history, many of you are much younger than I, and maybe you were never privileged to see the TV program Roots. But in that program, the Alex Haley traced his ancestry back to Gambia. And the first of his ancestors to come here was a Muslim named Kente Kute. And part of the problem was trying to get Kuta Kente to renounce his Muslim identity and his name. And finally, through a lot of violence, he accepted the Americanized name given to him by the slave master of Toby. Terrorism and violence, I know I'm pushing the time a little bit. I've got so I wrote too much. Um, It is, really, is it really fair to talk about the violence of Muslim terrorists without talking about the violence of this nation and its individuals? A member of my church once asked, why are Muslims always forced to renounce terrorism? He said, I don't ever recall white people renouncing or denouncing what Ter Timothy McVeigh did, or saying that he doesn't represent all white people, and have we ever heard white Christians say, the Ku Klux Klan doesn't really represent us, all Christians. There is so much that I want to say, and I can't because I'm out of time. <laughs> but I will say a couple of things I just have to, there was a book produced in the 1970s by Julius Lester, and it was entitled, Look Out Whitey, Black Power is Gonna Get Your Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was a pretty good book. And I showed it to one of my colleagues at the University of Alabama, and he said, it can have my mama. <laughs> <laughs> I think now for many people is Sharia law is going to get your judicial system. While there is this focus on the Middle East, it is an important focus to remember in terms of the, what is happening in Palestine, Israel. And I just have to say this, because I have felt myself almost afraid to say anything about that issue. I did before I came here. I spoke out on it when I was at the Ohio University, and it was called anti-Semitic as a result of it, of just raising the question of rights of Palestinians. And I heard it here at the GTU not too long ago when we had a forum here, that one has to be careful in terms of raising policies about Israel regardless of how brutal, because it borders on anti-Semitism. I think this has to be a place where all questions are raised, including that one. I wonder at times, Premier, if you and CIS, the CIS also suffer on the need to mask yourselves when it comes to Islamophobia. Or do you feel supported in walking and talking in your truth and not diminish or betray your truth? in order to get along. 
to cohere with the dictates of empire, even as manifested here the GTU. I know you all and taught with integrity. You have said, and it's very important for us to hear it, that it's not just the students who need information about Islam, but all of us, faculty, staff, top administrators. And I hope that somehow we can begin to become more educated. I feel that not only must we reframe, but we must also reimagine who and what we could be as a GGU, as the extraordinary consortium that we are. In the beginning was imagination, and that imagination created the world. Let us imagine the new and create a new world, a new community here at the GTU. If you have a question, please step up to the mic, okay? So we all want to hear your question, okay? that sometimes as a new student speaking is never easy because the tendency is to try to edit ourselves so we don't come across as too aggressive. But I had a, I heard this morning on NPR on something um, a Palestinian woman speaking on the radio about some of the stuff that is happening in Palestine. About some I'm not very familiar about that. But I got myself thinking what does it what does that do to scholars at such a place like this, living under such a cloud, doing scholarly work, when the reality on the ground is some heartbreaking stuff is happening. How do we reconcile our full humanity with the reality of, how do we bring that responsibility so that we coexist in a responsible manner without uh, meeting our true selves? I would be glad to hear how you handle that without coming across as militant and wanting to bomb everyone. Like, how do you do that? How do you balance all that? The pain and the threat to the being here. Thank you, Gideon. Um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question, of course. I mean, I, I, I take the position that we are never just fully one thing, that we emerge in our, uh, uh, we, we become in our encounters with, with others, right? That we're not just givens, but that we are transformed uh, each time we are in conversation with others. I think it's an important uh, conversation that has to happen, it, it has been happening, um, and that we have to be more uh, intentional about it as well. Um, I'm not sure which program you're referring to, but there is one today at, uh, at BCC by Noura Arakat, uh, who's yeah, presenting. Um, she's, so we have competition tonight, but yeah, she, she's presenting and it's, it's uh, um, you know, it's on these issues. Um, I, I think the GTU is actually an extraordinary place for us to, uh, to actually do this work. You know, we have a track record in doing this work. Uh, we have always asked the difficult questions. Uh, we have done them with respect to the different um, places that people are at. Um, I, I remember uh, hearing you speak about um, you know, it's always kind of like the anger that has to be brought to a simmer. Cornell West used that uh, term. It's always the anger or the boil that has to be brought to a simmer. Mm -hmm. um, we have a right. There's a there's a there's a there's a right that people have to be angry as well, right? Um, but to do that in a safe place like the GTU, um, I, I think is important. I think it's important to express ourselves. Um, as I said, it is sad for me to hear that people increasingly feel that they can't do that. Um, I think we need to uh, re-enchant this place. <laughs> I think we need to bring our traditions, bring our histories, uh, bring who we are 
and, um, and, and be open to being transformed in our encounters with each other. First, want to express my gratitude uh, for that profound talk that you uh, blessed us with, uh, and I also want to um, thank you, especially as a student here. Uh, it is because of you that I found uh, a room at CIS, and it is you who helped me see GTU as a home in a room in that home. So. Um, uh, I, I want to be, uh, I want to really call out and say that uh, Professor Jiva's classes and his courses have been a place where students of minority have been able to express their, um, their fragility, uh, sometimes the intimidation that they feel, sometimes because of their race, because of their gender, because of their ethnicity. Uh, students really feel that they're not able to share because they will be judged from their different locations. And I want to thank you for giving us that space where we can actually talk uh, to a mentor and to a guide. Um, I am really hopeful that the GTU uh, will live up to its interreligious uh, space that it, uh, that it is promising itself to be. But I want to ask you as a visionary leader, and thank you for being that leader and mentor for us. I want to ask you as a visionary leader, what do you see as a strategy to give this beautiful accolade that GTU has as an interreligious space? How can, you, how can you make sure that the CIS or Islamic studies or confessional studies besides Christian confessional studies will be harbored here and will uh, flourish here and allow people, students and faculty a chance to get to know the interreligiosity of this place? What do you envisage? What are your plans? So thank you for your um, for your sentiments and your thoughts and your acknowledgement. Um, so I guess my paper wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, you know, I have to say that it's an extraordinary place. Like, where else could you be? Where there's a center for Jewish studies, where we've had a long tradition of working in this mother Madrasa program, one of a kind in the country, possibly in the world. I don't want to, you know. Uh, Take that credit, but you know that um, that we address very difficult issues. To Gideon's question, you know we've been we've been doing that. Um, uh, the work that we do with Center for Dharma Studies, with sustainability, uh, that Dr. Rita Sharma has been leading. Um, the work that's done at the CTNS and here, uh, that this is a remarkable opportunity to bring various traditions together as we continue to um, uh, bring in more traditions. Um, with sciences, with the arts, I, I think this is, it's, it's all set up, you know. Um, it's a matter of our sort of active will in, in that kind of engagement. Uh, we were having discussions earlier where there was a question around the difference between diversity, multi-religiosity, inter-religiosity, and pluralism. And I think that we are, we are much beyond the diversity. Um, I, I think people express that we might not be, but. Uh, I think we're beyond just diversity, you know, let's just look at our, our differences. Um, we are pluralist in the sense that we attempt to engage each other. Uh, we do it across traditions, within our traditions, um, and we do so uh, intra-Islamically, intra-Jewishly, intra, uh, in, in all our traditions, but also inter-religiously. Uh, we do it academically, interdisciplinarily. So it's, it's it, the, the place is already set up for, for this work. I think people need to sort of uh, find their voice within that and to take up space and to be able to feel like they're welcome to, to be able to share uh, even the most contentious issues. If we can't sort that out here, we can't do it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. you know, I think this is a very, very special place um, that uh, provides this amazing opportunity um, and to points also made earlier uh, today, we, we have uh, to be both critical and grateful at the same time, and these are these are not mutually uh, exclusive. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to to show gratitude, to be critical, to push the boundaries, uh, and to take up space. And thank you for for all the incredible work that, uh, that you're doing as well. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. 
Uh, I have another question, but I want to proceed with a comment um, building on what Benjamin mentioned. Uh, Professor Jiwa really has created a space for Muslims to feel at home while studying in Western academic institutions. I remember I had studied classically in Egypt. I came, was looking for a program to build my studies, and I've taught and lectured and visited many universities, but I could not find a place that would accept me as a Muslim practicing, you know, faithful, uh, adherent to that tradition. Rather, one professor from an, at a very big institution, I was taking one of his classes, and he told me, you're not going to be successful in Western academia. I said, why not? Is it because of my grades? No, my grades were great, and alhamdulillah. But the problem was, they said, you're coming in believing already. You come in as a believing, practicing Muslim, and I want you to leave everything you studied in your own classical tradition, everything that you came in believing at the door, and let me rewire you for you. And so I felt there was a clash of civilizations you know, within me. <laughs> but when I came to the GTU, I found a place, I don't want to use you know, the <laughs> third space you know, term, but I found a place where you could be a scholar, an academic, do subjective work, and still hold on to your tradition. So thank you, Professor Jiwa, for providing that for me and for all of us. And I, I've never told him this before, but my wife and my mother are always praying for him. <laughs> every, every time we meet and we bring up work, it's like, you know, may Allah bless Professor Jiwa, may Allah reward him. You know, he's making you know, things very easy for all of you students and giving guys a safe space and working hard for you. And that's very true. Many people don't know that Professor Jiwa works 15 hours a day in his office. And then after that, he meets us at Strada to answer our questions <laughs> later at night. So I wanted to, you know, proceed uh, or, uh, with that comment. Thank you very much for that. I wouldn't be where I am without you. And I look very forward to working with you, you know, for the rest of my life as if that's decreed by God. Uh, my question is, you mentioned some of the languages and the backgrounds that CIS students have. Maybe um, it'd be nice to also mention some of the work, the actual research areas that our students are doing. Because uh, oftentimes, you know, people don't know what great work is happening at the CIS. And when I go around and I lecture and I visit and I teach, and people ask me, where should I go to continue graduate studies in Islamic studies? I say, come to the GTU. And so maybe it'd be nice maybe to share with our friends uh, here um, at uh, the GTU what we're actually doing, what are some of the research areas, and what areas some of our students are excelling in and break working, uh, break, breakthrough work that some of us are doing at the CIS. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ahmed, for your uh, heartfelt comments and reflections. And um, you can now go back to uh, UC Berkeley and, and show them what you've got. <laughs> uh, he did his undergrad work there in legal studies. And, uh, um, and when he came to GTU, there was always this kind of, how do I balance this kind of secular, religious, um, these contexts. And so um, it, it's, it's very heartening uh, to hear that you've, you've you know, found a place here. And um, your courses, uh, students seem to be thriving and, and loving your courses as well. So to, just to respond to a couple of things he mentioned, um, that Ahmed mentioned, uh, I've, just, I've been rereading um, uh, Sabah Mahmoud, uh, Talal Asad, Judith Butler, and Wendy Brown's book uh, is Critique Secular. Um, and it's, it's really uh, part of my, uh, my work today was, is, has been informed by that. Um, but I was rereading it in terms of the ways in which um, uh, religious, religiously committed people are often seen to be not uh, sufficiently critical enough. Um, so uh, in a kind of... Um, Sort of to, to put it sort of largely in Western Christianity, but in terms of Protestantism, uh, we have a sense that um, one should be able to disconnect from uh, from one's uh, beliefs and one's practices, mm -hmm. so that um, you you can be critical once you're sufficiently sort of uh, distant from your religion, right? So uh, the less religion you have, the more likely you are to flourish and be mm -hmm. open-minded and critical. And, and all of that, and we, and we found that to be not the case in many instances, right? So um, I would recommend uh, even just reading that. It's particularly around the offense that was caused by the Danish cartoons um, and kind of what that meant in terms of the misunderstanding of, uh, of how uh, liberal offense was received in, in religious uh, uh, communities. Um, the question about uh, the diversity of, of what people are doing, that is 
why I'm here. I mean, I, I just thrive in um, working with all our students who are doing work from, we just had a, a fantastic thesis, MA thesis on um, uh, Muslims in the Atlantic slave trade, right? Uh, they were brought over forcibly from West Africa into the Americas. Uh, we have uh, your work on Islamic law. Um, Ahmed's work not only looks at the kind of uh, kind of theoretical uh, things. I know he's also very interested in the kind of comparative work across traditions, uh, especially midrash and how people kind of uh, deal with texts. But um, but he's also kind of uh, he gives fatwas uh, on the phone and online. So in between things, he's sort of uh, you know this person who has to attend to that. Um, Hajibin's work on uh, on uh, uh, gender, especially looking at the Fa uh, sermon of Fatima, uh, is an incredible work. Uh, May is teaching a course this semester on critical race theory, which I'm hearing brilliant things about. We have uh, someone working on Islamic finance. Uh, we have Josefa, who's been working with Haas, and his, whose work is kind of looking at uh, Islamophobia. So we have a range of students, both kind of uh, grounded in the classical Islamic tradition, Quranic studies, Hadith studies, looking at Shi'i Muslim uh, theological um, uh, differences and, and overlaps. Uh, we have people who are doing stuff on gender and race, um, intersectionality, uh, the history of Islam and Muslims in America. So uh, we have lots of people doing work on, on the arts, um, especially our longtime uh, scholar, uh, who's no longer visiting scholar, research scholar Carol Beer, who's been working on uh, Islamic art and architecture. So we do have a, a range of students' uh, works, and we, we hope that we'll have uh, a conference again, uh, maybe not like the one we had in May 2017, which, which was an all-day conference, but maybe spread it out so that every semester we have a few students uh, presenting their, uh, to their, work, their work to the, with the larger uh, GTU. And I think sharing that um, with students in Jewish studies, Dharma studies, in the other traditions, in the arts, in the sciences, is really critical. I think that that's uh, sort of where you kind of come alive, you know, with, with uh, questions uh, not just within um, your study of that tradition, but when you're studying interreligiously. Uh, I think that that has um, a huge added uh, positive element to our, to our work. One more question. Oh. May I? Yes. Last question. Thank you. I want to first thank not only Linear Jiwa, but also uh, Dean Uriah Kim and Sister Marianne Farina and Reverend Dorsey Blake. And this is an incredible evening. So thank you all for your contribution and the way you choreographed it and organized the evening. And thank you, Nina, for just an amazing articulation of a problem and its larger context and what we might do at the GTU to address it. As a non-Muslim for years with the Center for Islamic Studies, I wanted to offer um, both a comment and uh, a final question. The comment is in response to Majabin's, um, so what strategies might we approach to address this problem? And I think the first strategy in addressing any problem is the acknowledgement that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that you beautifully articulated at least the parameters of it, if not yet the underlying stress that indeed many of us face, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, um, within the GTU. But if we look to the larger world in which we live, um, the problem is even greater. <laughs> and I would offer that one, one reason for that is exactly how you address the five media pillars. It's that news is newsworthy. And there is a whole other aspect of why those media pillars are such profound what have become normative frames for looking at Islam and Muslims. And that leads me to the question of where does ignorance fit in? That if news is newsworthy, the normative aspects of Islam are not coming to the fore in news. And how does ignorance feed those five media pillars? Thank you.
Thank you, Carol. Um, also, you, you know, a um, difficult question, but, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting because my background is in communication studies, so everything was about sound bites, getting things out in small packages. Then I made this crazy move to academia, which was all about expand and nuance and complexify. And, you know, so you're, you're caught between these two sort of, you know, how to, how to package things and get things out in these sound bites um, for people to hear and listen. And, and then how do you, I mean, it reminds me of the interview that I did, and I did very few after that, partly because it was, that was so such a disruptive kind of experience. Um, and this is someone who was, uh, you know, published uh, six books, who's, you know, very well acquainted, very nice person, um, sensitive otherwise, um, and that article came out all wrong. Um, not all wrong, but a lot of it. Um, and, and even with the nuance, even with that. So I think that part of it is that um, we have to look for alternative uh, news sites. So even if you have journalists and others who are sensitive to these, um, media are also kind of produced by I mean, their they're corporations, you know, they're, and they're corporately sponsored, so they have to tow a certain kind of line. So I think we have to increasingly start looking to alternative media, social media, um, looking at different ways in which we get our news, um, have different kinds of friendships, be in different kinds of spaces, um, you know, challenge ourselves, um, take courses, uh, read, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> even reading practices have, ch have changed, right? So, um, and, and, and I think that that's, that's kind of what we've, what we've got in, in an age where there's increased um, uh, 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 sound bites and less attention paid to things. I mean, I won't get into the psychological aspects of our attention spans and what's happened over the years, but the saturation of information and how we manage it is it pushes us now into sort of thinking about how we um, uh, how we even retain uh, the things that we do, um, how reading practices have changed. Uh, and so I think that we need to push ourselves uh, in different spaces, different conversations, and in different um, uh, getting our our, uh, our information from different sources, diversifying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, don't go yet. Uh, Dr. Blake has something to say. Before uh, I ended my presentation, because I knew I was out of time, but there was something I wanted to read and I decided not to, but I would like to leave you with this. And it's from the writings from Dr. Howard Thurman. It says, one day there will stand up in their midst, one who will tell a new sickness among the children who, in their delirium, call for their brothers and sisters whom they had never known from whom they had been cut off behind the self-imposed barriers of their fathers. An alarm will spread throughout the community that it is being felt and slowly realized that community cannot feed for long on itself. It can only flourish where always the boundaries are giving way to the coming of others from beyond them, unknown and undiscovered sisters and brothers. Then the wisest among them will say, what we have sought, we have found, our own sense of identity. We have an established center out of which at last we can function and relate to others. We have committed to heart and to nervous system, a feeling of belonging, and our spirits are no longer isolated and afraid. We have lost our fear of our sisters and brothers, and are no longer ashamed of ourselves, of who and what we are. Let us now go forth to save the land of our birth from the plague which first drove us into 
the, quote, real to quarantine, unquote, and to separate ourselves be behind self-imposed walls. For this is why we were born. People, all people, belong to each other. And those who shut themselves away diminish themselves. And those who shut others away destroy themselves. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Remember, there is a reception uh, with plenty of food and non-alcoholic drinks in honor of Dr. Yuan. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I want you to walk over to the reception as soon as possible. Don't hang out here. Because reception without the guest of honor yeah, is just doesn't feel the same. Last two years, the lecturers stayed behind for too long and it really didn't feel like this. So, soon as we give you a big round of applause, I want you to run to the reception. Everybody just follow him. If you want to have a conversation with him and have fellowship with him, you need to be there. Okay? It has been a wonderful evening and you made it special and we're so grateful that you were able to attend. Let's give Dr. Dewar a